Thank you, Nan. Wow, uh, this is an amazing event. I am blown away by the beauty of innovation that's going on here. And uh, thank you for having me. I, I have to say straight up that um, I am not speaking as a representative of my company. You get poppy crumb today. All right. What do you think of when you see this image? What comes to mind? Earth? Maybe planet? Some people think of fragility, climate change, precious, maybe even blue marble. Well, let me tell you a story. I was in a planetarium a couple of years, uh, actually last year, with my two and a half year old daughter. And we're watching what, you know, often in a planetarium you see an event uh, like it was Journey to the Sun, and it starts in a busy city street, a lot like Sao Paulo or, or New York, and they do a zoom out from the city on our way to the sun that looks a lot like this image. It's completely quiet, and my two and a half year old yells as loud as she possibly could. Oh, wrong direction. Hello, I think I've lost my presentation. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, my two and a half year old yells as loud as she possibly could. Minions. Uh, is that what you think of when you see, an earth, see the earth? No, so, I, it, it sounded crazy to me, and trust me, a lot of people wondered what's going on with her. But it made a lot of sense when you realize her experientially established priors coming from this image. <laughs> so, as far as, you know, my daughter sees an image of the earth and thinks of little yellow creatures. But when you think of every time she's encountered an image like that, it's been right before her favorite movie. Now, as touches a, a very important part of how we think about our data and our experiences, which is that we all have vastly different experiences of the exact same information. And that's built on our, that's a product of our priors, our probabilistic experiences that lead up, our, you know, our priors come from, it's three things, our underlying biology, our exposure to information in the world, that drive deterministic responses so that we each experience a very different perceptual reality. None of us experience the same reality. The world as it lives as a physical stimulus is not the world that's translated through our biological experiences, our priors, our exposures, and our expectations. Those come together to shape what's our unique perceptual reality. And that allows our brains to be effective in the world, to emphasize and weight the information that's most important in our, to allow us to get away from the tiger, to find a crying baby, to communicate, to find a mate, to find food. Those are still the critical things we have to do as humans. Now, then you factor in our environments. The statistical distributions of everything we encounter in our spaces, whether we grew up in a village in Afghanistan, a town in Europe or the Midwest or a city like Sao Paulo in New York, they eat the statistical distributions of information in those environments shapes our brains. It doesn't just shape our subjective reality, it fundamentally shapes how our neurons respond and the underlying plasticity that makes each of us unique and each of us very different. If I grew up in a village, in, a, in, a, in an environment that has a lot of soft contours, or a lot of tones of beige, of tan, of gray, my neural sensitivities are going to be heightened to detect differences in those color regions, differences in those contours in ways that someone who hasn't grown up in those environments wouldn't be. Or if I've grown up in a city with different environmental pressures of noise, where the scene awareness I have to have to navigate a city street to know where information's coming from, uh, 
it, it's going to be very different and my brain's going to evolve to allow me to be effective in those environments. So there's two things that matter here, which is one, how malleable we are. And that, that is, a, our brain is constantly evolving to let us be successful in those ways. But also that we're different, because if we accept that, we're gonna, we're gonna communicate a lot better and we're gonna build technology that's way more effective for each one of us. Now, here's an example, uh, and I will only do this to my face, that's why you get to look at me for a moment. But there's a condition called facial dysmorphopsia, okay? And, and this is a condition that happens where um, it, whenever someone with facial dysmorphopsia, whenever they're looking at a, wherever their gaze is directed, they experience what's called a scotoma, so basically a blind spot. And their image, their experience fills in with nearby information. So it might look a lot like this. Go ahead and watch the yellow uh, X's everywhere you're looking. Okay. Okay, so you, you get the idea. Very distorted images of what you might be seeing. But it looks a lot like this, doesn't it? So this is an artist, a fairly famous artist named Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was known as an abstract artist who, uh, he painted distorted images, uh, faces that looked somewhat uh, uh, con configured a lot like this. Now here's the question. Many of us believe Francis Bacon had facial dysmorphopsia. And so what he was actually representing when he created these images was his own internal experience of the world, his perception. It was his reality. It wasn't an abstraction of it, it was what he experienced. And when we step back and think about that, it's, like, it's this opportunity of window into his, uh, empathetic understanding of how he might have experienced the world. Now, uh, thankfully, or maybe not thankfully, but we don't all have the abandon of a two and a half year old, authentic abandon of a two and a half year old where, yeah, I'm going to yell what I experience <laughs> when I'm in the middle of a movie theater or the ability to translate, I definitely don't, the artistic experience of my internal state to share with other people in the same way Francis Bacon could. But maybe we don't want to. As humans, most of us, or many of us, we want to have cognitive control over how we share our experiences, how we share our internal states, our stressors, our emotions, our feelings, our trials and tribulations. We want to have control over when we share that and when we don't. We all want to have our poker face. Now, but I think we have to accept that some degree of what we might call our cognitive sovereignty, our poker face, is, is a thing of the past. Not all of it, but part of it. And this is where there is something, it's a tra big transition that's happening. We've gone way past uh, machine learning and AI algorithms being able to detect whether I'm feigning a smile or a frown to actually being able to detect through my micro expressions the authenticity of whether my smile is real or fake, which right now is somewhere in between. And to the point where we can tell the authenticity of our emotions. And uh, why, does that sound scary to some of you? Yes, I see a lot of heads. It should. I, I'm not telling. All of these things should still sound scary because that, if, if you develop technology and you don't think about what the future could be, how are you going to build it right? How are you going to design for how the right regulations, the right legislation to make sure that things you maybe don't want to see don't happen? Any technology we develop can be amazing technology. And as we move in different directions, new technologies also create uh, dystopian applications sometimes that challenge our own ethics. There's a constant road ahead right now because technology and the capacity of what we can do and the benefit it can bring to each of us is quite phenomenal. I like to say we're at a juncture where it's 
from now on, and it's not going to stop. There's this constant vigilance that we have to be in where we're thinking about you know, assuring the benefits of technology can be brought to each and every one of us, while at the same time making sure we don't compromise our humanity. So we have to think about what we want to be able to do, how we build that, and how we protect against it, and how uh, we don't want to be seeing the potential 1984s that can, can appear and are. But with that same issue, that maybe that sounds very scary. The technology to do that is quite phenomenal and has benefited many people in healthcare. Uh, the idea that we want to understand and predict human behavior from the subconscious neural response has been around for a long time. We exchange data with each other all the time. As humans, we're really good at integrating an understanding of how we interact with each other. Each time, uh, there's multi-billion dollar businesses that look at you know, leveraging the non-cognitive neural response to get a window, a peek into predicting human behavior. It's targeted our, it's led to different changes in content programming, understanding how uh, different technology impacts human emotion. It's led to, in many cases, a lot of positive gains in uh, creating technology and programming that's had a stronger impact. So the question is, how do we want to do this? Not will it happen, but what will happen? And I want to take you through some of the things and some of the changes that are happening and signatures that are there. Now, there are a lot of things that can happen with our signatures. And I'm telling you some things that you're going to hear some things today that might seem a little oh, maybe creepy maybe a little off, uh, worrisome, but I also want you to step back and think about what that revolution, what that opportunity, what it's going to look like in the future and how we write that future because it's up to us to write the future we want to see. Okay? Now, I also want to step back and you know, things, think about the transformations we go through in relationship with our technology and relationship with our behavior. So if you step back 20 years, there's a meme that maybe some of you have heard. 20 years ago, um, in, in the 90s, the, the mantra, this has been, you've probably seen this on the internet, uh, what would a mother say to her child? She'd say, okay, don't talk to people on the internet, something I'm, I'm sure you, won't, you never do that, right? <laughs> and don't get into cars with strangers. Right? And now fast forward 20 years and we literally summon strangers from the internet and we climb into their cars. So what's happened? <laughs> and then, well, some things happen. There's, what's on the table? A couple of big things are on the table. One is convenience. Convenience will drive us. And that convenience can mean connectivity, can mean communication, socialization, opportunity. That's all driving shifts in our beliefs, in our morals. And that convenience transforms us. It trans also, we built an infrastructure underneath that to make us feel safe. So that what we thought 20 years ago to be completely not, we never do that, we do all the time, and it's actually environmentally helpful to our, it, it has many positive benefits that we leverage every day. So let's think about that. And three big transformations that I believe are happening, going to happen in the next five to 10 years where our consumer technology is significantly going to shape who we are and how we interact with each other are one, what I call empathetic technology will transform the relationship we have with each other and with the spaces where we work, train, heal, and live. And when I say empathetic technology in this case, I'm not talking about avatars or computers that are I'm not talking about robots trying to emulate human emotion or empathize with me. Rather, this is a closed-loop experience where our technology, all of our technology that's intelligent, makes use of my internal experience, my cognitive state, my, uh, my intent to, as one of its decision makers, as part of its interface. Technology, targeted neuroplasticity, will make us faster, recover more effectively, hear more acutely, see more sharply, and think more effectively. And this is something, we understand neuroplasticity and we've been studying it for uh, many, many years, but 
we're getting to a place where our technology can have a targeted intent in how it changes us and how it shapes us. And one size fits all technology will be a thing of the past. Technology will know more about us than we know. And I think that's something we have to accept. Now, our voice gives, it tells a much richer story than we used to think. It tells us, a, a, it's a great insight to our mental and physical wellness. Quick, quick aside, can everybody hear me? Am I, are you getting too much uh, low end? Am I, is it okay out there? Cool. Okay. So what we've learned in, I'd say, the last 10 years, that it's, that there's this immense richness to not what we say, but how we say it. For example, uh, machine learning and AI paired with the statistical dynamics, looking at, say, semantic coherence, syntactic complexity, groups have been able to show uh, predictive algorithms that predict the likelihood of psychosis within five years. Just based on the dynamics, the longitudinal uh, tracking of how someone speaks. Something like Alzheimer's. Sometimes uh, you, you know, you're able to look at, if you go in and look at the research, changes in the vocal patterns, the timing of someone's speech, paired with how they use their pronouns, it can be a predictor and something that shows up. With Alzheimer's, sometimes 10 years before a typical clinical diagnosis. With early intervention, the opportunities are really huge here. And moreover, the thing that's so important is it's about looking at the individual. We're getting to a place where our consumer technology, because of the relationship it has with us and can have with us, will know more about our mental and physical wellness than most clinical visits with a doctor. Because those are one data point in time as opposed to longitudinal data that actually enables an algorithm to understand me and understand how different I am from an individual, but to know when I've changed as opposed to when I've changed to a, against a mean or to that point in time. Um, I'm not getting... Uh, Hello? There we go. Multiple sclerosis also can show up as signatures in our voice. I'm going to need a new pointer. If someone could get me a new pointer, that would be great. Uh, bipolar disorder. Again, imagine uh, if you could track changes in your voice, and people are doing this. There are multiple startups looking at all of these, where you know, a lot of times with bipolar disorder, if you can anticipate by changes in someone's voice before someone has a manic episode, you can intervene. This, in a, this has huge opportunity to help people and to avoid situations that could have been prevented. The opportunities for mental wellness are huge. Uh, diabetes. The spectral coloration of our voices, um, how we speak, it alters. Uh, for, things can change in diabetes. I really need a new pointer, if someone can get me a new pointer. Hello? Okay, I need, I need new pointer. Okay, thanks, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry everyone, I just wanna make sure I can get, do this. Diabetes and heart disease, they both affect how we speak. And it's in the coloration, the spectral coloration. Heart disease affects, it causes, introduces aspiration into our vocals. Diabetes, because you end up with dehydration. When you're dehydrated, it can affect changes in the spectral coloration of your voice. Again, these are things that if I just went to see my doctor on one day, nothing would, it probably wouldn't be noticed. But if I have a consistency of interacting with someone, I'm able, and, and I have algorithms that track me, I'm, it's going to identify it. Parkinson's. Sorry. I have a pointer in my computer bag. If someone wants to plug it in and bring it to me, I'd be ready to go. All right. Now, 
I, I, yeah, we're good. All right, you're, are, are we good? Thank you so much. And oh, we're great, we're golden. Thank you so much. All right, uh, interpersonal health. Again, it's what you say is nowhere near as important in some cases as how you say it. Psychologists have been able to use machine learning algorithms and be able to predict in, with high accuracy the cessation or success of relationships. That's pretty crazy, right? Uh, because, again, it's the dynamics of how we speak. And they're not looking at the content. They're looking at the intonation patterns. They're looking at the intensity, the dynamic range. And that speaks volumes in how we interact with each other. Not that we want this, but when you start thinking about the devices we already have in our homes, they're going to be transformative in terms of how we capture our mental and physical wellness. Now, it's not just our voice. The biological signals we give off all the time are becoming part of the digital exhaust that gives a fairly rich picture of our internal experiences, because it's not just the signature of one of our biological signals, what's transitioned and happened in the last few years is that we have the amalgamation of all these different signatures paired with machine learning and AI, of sensors on us, in our environments, and around us that are able to paint these fairly rich pictures. And whether we like it or not, our bodies are always giving off these deterministic signals. That hasn't changed. What's changed is the ability of sensors to actually capture these things. And as humans, we actually are picking up a great deal of this data. We, we have an empathetic connection to understand each other and to pick up on the subtleties that are unspoken. So for example, many species do this naturally. They have you know, these predictive responses to information in the world. And we get to peek in and see how, you know, the, how biology is driving this interaction with the physical stimulus in, in our environments. So here's an example, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, this is a spider in my garden, and uh, bear, bear with me, I'm a violinist, but uh, you'll see what I, how this spider is responding to my singing. So <laughs> it turns out some spider sorry turns out some spiders tune their webs to resonate like violins and likely uh, the harmonics of my voice coupled with a change in intensity cause the spider to react uh, as if I were an echolocating bat or a bird, a predatory species, and the spider did what it should. It, it predictively told me to bug off, right? And um, I like to say the spider sort of wearing its internal state on its sleeve. We get to peek in. <laughs> we get to peek in and, sorry, we get to peek in and see in a moment. We get to peek in and see how biology is responding to the external world. And uh, we may think, and or at least I know a lot of us like to think we're different than that spider, but in fact, uh, we're not that different from the spider in some way. So I want you to watch this for a moment. Um, you're going to see the, di I want you to watch the diameter of this pupil, okay? It's gonna change. And it turns out this, the response I'm showing you is, has nothing to do with changes in light. We all know that light affects the diameter of the pupil, but has everything to do with mental effort. Uh, your pupil gives away how hard your brain is working. Also, whether you're engaged in, in a particular uh, task you're doing or whether you're, when you're talking to someone, your pupil's dilating, dependent on all that information. Uh, so listen, uh, it's going to, in this environment, it might not work so well, but I promise that your pupil will, the diameter of your pupil would be doing the same thing as the subject in this lab if you were listening to these exactly as they were. All right, so you're going to go. 
One second. I think I'm, here we go. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening to my talk right now. Someone back there to, I, so, so I just want to make sure, I can talk about a lot of things so we can go offline, but I do want to play some things for you. Now, here we go. Here we go. Intelligent, Intelligent technology depends, depends on, on personal, personal data. data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. All right, so when you're trying to understand the two talkers, your brain's having to work harder. In an, any environment, if these are co-located, it's a very difficult problem. And your, pup your autonomic nervous system drives your pupil to dilate. And then when one talker's going to drop out, and it gets easier, you can listen one more time. Well, maybe not. We might have to just leave it here. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. But the idea is that, look, Wait, okay, my, my, my talk is just moving and I'm not touching anything. Can I? Um, all right. Nay? Uh, um, is someone here that is Okay, this is not working at all. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why don't I take a question for a moment and talk to you? Because I, I do want to, I, I think you'll like some of the stuff we're going to talk about. It's not just about American football. This is only one tiny portion of it, I promise. But um, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. And what we're going to talk about is, is not just the biological signals, but also how plasticity shapes our brain and what that really means, what the opportunities are. Um, so we'll get there in a moment. But I want to make sure we've got this. OK, I think we're getting closer. There. That, that looks like we're in a good place, but... Intelligent technology depends on personal data. 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 Do I get... Um, all right. So should I just trigger when we get uh, to things? That's fine. Okay, so it's the end of the poker face. That's what I want you to think about. These deterministic signals we give off, these are things that our bodies do autonomically. It's not cognitive. It's not that I get to choose. They happen without our agency in many cases. And you've got sensors on your bodies, but also in our environments. Think about pupil diameter right now. That's something that 20, well, 10 years ago, we, you know, devices in the labs cost $20,000, $30,000 to really do accurately. Now, those are devices that cost maybe, uh, are you know, non-contact. People, uh, trackers cost tens, hundreds of dollars, but also the, the hardware going into every intelligent smart pair of glasses going forward it's costing pennies uh, to dollars. You know, tracking our cognitive effort, our cognitive load through the diameter of our pupil is something that's going to become ubiquitous in all of our technology. Our technology will know that. You can imagine having your own, how that might shape my ability to hear, where everywhere I am, if my brain, if my device knows my brain's having to work harder, and because my pupil's dilating, I automatically, the signal to noise ratio of my background and who you're listening to gets amplified, or even spatializing sound will also cause your pupil to dilate or to not dilate. Because, hello. <laughs> Because that's changing how I how hard my brain is having to work. I'm afraid to talk right now. 
Okay. And three. Okay. 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 Can you change the microphone? But that's not going to change my clicker. The clicker is the issue. We're getting some interference. Okay. Is that better? So sorry. I'm so sorry. Is there a clicker? I have one in. I have a clicker in my bag. I see. Okay. No worries. I'm also happy. Do you know what? If someone sits back there, I can do this. I can. Absolutely. Just absolutely. I'm sorry, everybody. It's me, I think. <laughs> it's my, the amalgamation of my biological signals are somebody's working, hacking, somebody's hacked me somehow, so. <laughs> Bear with me, okay? All right, so this is something we're going to come back to because I'm going to show you some ways that this really is where we're going and how we can think about this in a positive way because I, I do want you to think about all the things that could happen that might be terrifying, might be scary, and then we'll, we'll but how can this help us and why can't it help us? Next slide. Now, I said technology targeted neuroplasticity. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent, yes. It's gonna make us faster, recover more effectively, hear more acutely. What do I mean by that? So, um, anytime you look in nature and there's predatory relationships or species in the different and challenging environments, you know, the, their brains evolve to do these amazing things. Like when I, I, I teach my course, I teach a course at Stanford that I'm going to tell you about a little bit, which is called Neuroplasticity in Video Gaming. It's focused on sound and our senses. But we code up, my students code all sorts of crazy games, but with intent on how it's going to shape our brain. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the neural circuits that change when we put ourselves in environments that are really competitive and engaging, and we spend hours doing these things. And the same thing happens. We can learn so much from looking about other species at the superpowers they develop. Where you might look at a species that seems completely innocuous on you know, tertiary first glance, but then you realize the capacity of what they can do because of how their brain has evolved to do something that enables them, because they still have to, they have to communicate, they have to find a mate, they have to be able to breed, and they have to be able to find food. And if one of those things is compromised, but another one's plentiful, their bodies are gonna evolve to let them do things that they otherwise wouldn't. And then they have to, the predatory relationship of what they eat and who eats them completely shapes the dynamics of their brain. And those are the evolutionary pressures put on their environments. And think about what those are like in the cities you live. Because when I think about technology development, I'm always thinking about how is it gonna evolve us? How's it gonna shape who we are and why? So. In my class, that's exactly what we do, is we build games, but with intent, to think about how it's going to shape our brains in different ways. And you know, with, with, with virtual, the more immersive we become in our game environments, the more opportunity we have to actually shape our brains in different ways. I mean, you can think about, I mean, my students will build things for rehabilitation, for learning, but you might not realize that even Call of Duty, how many of you play Call of Duty? Anyone? Some of you, a few of you? Like, when people who play hours of Call of Duty, and not that many hours, even playing 40 hours of Call of Duty, they see the world differently. Their visual acuity is more heightened. Their strategic thinking is, has changed in, in a positive way. You get these different benefits of immersed environments when you're solving problems based on not just the game itself, but the dynamics, the sensory dynamics of the game and how you have to be effective in that environment. And that has a huge impact. 
and it lasts. It's not just while you're playing the game, you can go back a year later and some, the brain is still different. So we think about how you design games to think about that. And one of the things that is really impactful is, well, so has anyone ever seen this image? A few of you? Okay, so this is a homunculus. And this homunculus is, you'd see if you took a neuroscience class, any introductory neuroscience class, you might see this creature, okay? And this creature is really a three-dimensional data representation of the average human somatosensory cortex from about 80 years ago, okay? So what you've done, and this is Wilder Penfield, uh, went in and was like, that these were awake humans, but he went and studied their brain in invasively. It would touch parts of their somatosensory cortex and see what sensation they had on their body. And, you know, this actually represents your neural receptive fields. And when we say a receptive field, a receptive field of a cell is basically the optimal stimulus set, optimal information in the world that that cell cares about, right? And when you develop, uh, when you have expertise at something, or as humans, when we evolve to do something well, the number of cells change that care about the inform that information. If I'm, I'm a violinist, so the number of cells that are devoted to, to my sensory capacity to move my fingers and feel differences in how I play the violin is are going to be much more magnified in my brain relative to someone who isn't. Or if I'm a, a kicker or a, a, a gamer and I have to care about reaction time in my hands, all these things shape our brains in very specific ways. And you can imagine this creature, if you think about your own sensitivities, just average as humans, our lips are more sensitive, backs of our wrists, and places as opposed to our backs. You know, we don't have very much sensitivity on our back comparatively to our lips or, or, or other places on our face, right? So this is simply a data representation. Now, I ask my students two questions when they come into class. One of them is I, you know, and I, I, in my class I get elite athletes, elite musicians. I get, you know, computer science graduate students. This is at Stanford. And I get all sorts of, it's, it's a big mix of individuals, but they're, you know, everyone is, no matter who you are, you have your superpowers. So, so that's the first thing I ask them is like, what is your superpower and how, what does your homunculus look like? Like, what are the things that you do well and can you think about what in your body shapes how your homunculus looks different than this average? Because we all are very different. And the second thing I asked them is, okay, what's wrong with this? This is an 80-year-old 3D data representation of an average human. And, sorry, back. No, back, back, no. Okay, sorry, of an average human. And this has changed today. And most 19-year-olds will look at this and tell me immediately, what would you say? They'll tell me the thumbs. The thumbs are different than they use because we do this all day. We do this all day now. We've changed as a species. Our hum average homunculus has changed. Now, we're going to be a different, now, we're going to be different in three years and five years. Now, this is American football, the only example of American football, I promise. But go ahead and watch this and watch this is Eli Manning, you know, Super Bowl quarterback. But now, watch, look at this. He like falls down and nobody touches him. He's like an intentional fall. What's going on? People might, he heard footsteps, he did something. But what I want you to think about here is something's going on in his scene awareness, his cognitive decision making that is, is not as good, not as optimal as it could be, right? And how we evolve human performance isn't just about physical uh, skill and that and, and how we change our somatosensory cortex and how well he cuts and how well he thinks but it's also simply about our baseline sensory awareness and our criterion to engage information and how we make use of that and those are all things that we can train because it's all about going to be about how we train our cognition to interact with our technology going forward and that's going to shape our brain and shape who we become as humans because it's going to be different and we have a huge amount of, of potential to modify that next this is where I say technology targeted neuroplasticity is going to shape who we are. And as developers, we can think about that in a very new way. Okay. Now, next. When you think about something like snowboarding, okay? And snowboarding at the X Games, 
amazing things, amazing capacity that people have to do things here. But it's not, it hasn't evolved. This evolution hasn't happened just because you know, snowboarding technology, you know, snowboards exist and they've gotten fancier and they look better and they go faster. It's a sort of trifecta. You might say it's that technology has been built. That's number one. Number two is we've evolved our capacity to train new behaviors that enable people to, to do these amazing skills. Those are great. But then there's this third parallel development that's been pivotal in transforming human performance here, which is the idea that medical technology has evolved and the risk of engagement for doing things that put us in compromising positions and pushing those limits has changed. You know, the, the fear of breaking my arm is different than it was and the ramifications that came with it are different than they were 100 years ago, right? We've evolved in that way. And I like to say it's like the end of the Humpty Dumpty era. We believe we can be put back together again. So we're gonna engage and do things in a very different way. We get to evolve human performance because we've changed our criterion for what we think we can do and what it means to do those things. Now, going back to how we build technology that lets us touch human experience. Empathetic technology and building technology that optimizes to each of us and that isn't a one-size-fits-all is one of the most transformative ways that technology can actually empower us and really serve us in the future. Right now, technology is built to specification, but in fact, most of us experience it very differently. And to develop technology, there's a couple of things that we have to have. To do this, we have to have control. Control, insight. Control, insight, and then we can build creatively. So one of the things I was gonna say here, so just so some of you know, I'm, I'm a neurophysiologist by training. That's what I spent a lot of my life doing was thinking about how we take the information in the world, the data, and how our physiological system in our brain translates that perceptually to the experiences we have. But as a systems neuroscience, you're looking for what's the dimensionality reduction that matters, what's the data and information transformation that, that, that's critical, and we want to avoid artifacts. Now I basically do the same thing, and I think about it with regard to our content and what we build and for, as a developers. We create experiences and we want that to be translated throughout the entire pathway. But we need these three things. Now, when I say control, I want you to think about this. This is just an example of what I mean by control. All right. So I want you to look up at the sunlight. If you're gazing at the sunlight, you probably are experiencing some bubbles. And those bubbles might seem to float up and off at an angle. Does everyone experience that? Okay, now I want you to shift your gaze to those bubbles. Okay, and what happens? You realize the bubbles are going straight up as opposed to off at an angle. Go back and forth, because even knowing your knowledge of what, how they're moving, it's not gonna change your experience, right? What's happening there is you, it's a contrast between local and global visual gradings. You've got a horizontal grading that's moving at the same time in conflict with the vertical. And when your gaze is directed at it, your brain can resolve it. That, so it actually is the underlying phenomena of what happens to a, a batter during a curveball. But, um, there's something, when, you're, when your gaze is directed to sunlight, your brain integrates this local and global motion. And it's not, that perception is just as real, and it's just as correct, but it's different. And that's what's important. So if I'm a developer, and again, this is just an example of what I mean. If I'm a developer and I'm someone trying to control experience, I really have no idea what someone's experiencing, because I can have such vastly different experiences looking at the same piece of content. But, there's one piece of information I could have that would suddenly give me this immense control over my user's experience, which is just knowing where their eyes are directed. If I know where their gaze is directed on that screen, suddenly I've gained this world of insight into their internal state, their internal experience of this piece of content and information. And that has huge impact on how I think about the world. Now, so I say, 
we need to have control, but we need to have insight. And there are a lot of different ways we can pick up on these biological signal signatures and information about what we're, our internal experience is actually taking in. So behind me is a time series, okay? And I'll tell you that this is a galvanic skin response. This is actually response to someone's, uh, we're measuring uh, the, skin, the conductance of someone's skin while they're watching a piece of content, okay? Just changes in skin conduct. Does anyone have an idea of what they're watching? All right, so I'm watching a soccer match. And, and football, sorry. <laughs> Real football, trust me, I know. And uh, what's important here is that this particular individual doesn't have allegiance to a team, isn't even a, you know, a, 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 any diehard, but he's watching a series of pen penalty kicks, okay? And look at the next slide. When you go back and code for penalty kicks, you can perfectly predict everywhere there was a penalty kick just looking at the conductance of his skin. That human anticipation, even when we don't have a strong desire or um, influence to it, you can't turn it off. We, there's events in the world, this happens to be a, one that, that we could recreate, but there's so many places where we can do that, where it causes us to have these physiological reactions that are becoming ubiquitous in how our technology will understand us. Our bodies radiate our stories. Um, the, they're the underlying thermal dynamics of your body and how engaged you are, our cognitive load, can be seen as uh, signatures in our infrared thermal image showing up behind me where reds are hotter and blues are cooler. Uh, you can imagine, we can, we can see engagement, we can see uh, stress with uh, derivatives of positions on people's faces. We can even, and we actually did this, we can create content like fire uh, with high luminance that we can see when someone's experiencing it as real flame simply by recognizing the uh, in increased contrast and dynamic range that they never experienced an image uh, that wasn't real, I mean that wasn't real, that was that bright on the retina and we can actually see their bodies give off heat as if they're experiencing fire just looking at a picture. Just pretty uh, crazy when you think about it but it's about the power of immersive experiences to actually engage our physiological systems based on those probabilistic priors and things that we come into the world with with every interaction we have. So as developers, we have this huge power to engage each of us in these very specific and real ways that leave much more impactful experiences. You can imagine uh, you can imagine dimensions of this thermal response, and people are doing this because you don't want to. I don't know. I don't think any of us would know what to do with looking at a thermal signature other than being able to find our our cat when it's outside or something. But it's the dimensions of data and translations that dimensionality reduction can be hugely informative to how engaged we are and you know my, uh, indicators of interpersonal interest and how we're, we're how we're interacting with each other. Uh, the chemical composition of our breath gives away what we're feeling. There's a dynamic mixture of carbon dioxide, acetone, and isoprene that changes when your heart speeds up or your muscles tense. All of these things affect your exhalant and how, what we breathe. And it's not just what we breathe that changes, it's then what it, what we exhale, but it's then what we each breathe when we're near each other, because that in turn starts affecting our social interactions together as well. Uh, in this case, people actually were looking at carbon dioxide levels uh, on Hunger Games, and if you go back and look at the trace of the audience, you can tell exactly where Katniss's dress uh, caught on fire. Uh, we've done uh, some of my team members were looking at, has anyone seen Free Solo with uh, Alex Honnold climbing up cap without ropes? It's a fairly, it's, there's a lot of suspense. It comes with the fact <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen other than you do know he survives, hopefully. Um, but I wasn't there to see the film, and we had the filmmakers in, and I looked at the CO2 trace, and I could 
tell, I'm a rock climber, I could tell exactly where the climbs were and where he abandoned the climbs, just based, just looking at the carbon dioxide level of the audience in the theater. Yeah, that is hugely impactful. When we're together, we're leaving these, we're broadcasting a, a chemical signature of what we're feeling. And we can pick that up and we can understand it. So in this way, it is the end of the poker face. The chemical, the signatures that we give off are going to be available, but it's an era of authenticity. I like to say it's the era of the empath is beginning. We will know more about each other than we ever have. It's gonna change who we are, how we are. But those interactions, our spaces can know more about us. Our spaces can work with us. We can have a dynamic relationship with how we interact in our environments. You know, our spaces don't have to be static. Our spaces, when you think about how uh, the space around you evolves, whether it's temperature, lighting, color, sound, all of these things are dynamic and can optimize who we are. We, you know, the, 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 think about a thermostat. 30 years ago, what did we do? We set a threshold and we said on, off, depending on, cross that threshold. Then we progressed to maybe programming a story of my week and behave in this way. Today we have thermostats that you know, learn our behaviors and it enables us to save money, save resources. But they're missing one step, which is they don't know what our cognitive intent, what we're trying to do in that environment is. How is it optimized for us to be as effective as we can and should be in those environments? The amalgamated sensing of all this information is in many ways, it's crazy, but might sound crazy, but by tracking more information, it's giving people more freedom and autonomy. People who are aging, people who might otherwise require a different degree of caretaking are enabled to live autonomously and be able to have where it's not just if, if you have grandparents and you worry about whether they take their medications, now you actually know are they depressed? Are they lonely? Uh, should we go visit them? Do they, you know, is there something that's changed that we can intervene in in a way that could have an impact on their mental and physical health? Well, our consumer devices, the devices in our spaces that we use for you know, making coffee, playing music, watching TV. The amalgamation of them will, can and will know more about our mental and physical wellness than our clinical visits. And that is something that's real. And it's going to shape our relationship with our technology and our relationship with our doctors. Another point of contact, which I'll go through quickly, is it's not just in the spaces, just in your ear. The ear is an amazing place, and I've spent a lot of time studying the ear. So I, I get to tell you about it. But when you think, right now we develop technology for the external world. We might have microphones that pick up on the semantic information in the world. And then we build technology to interact with us. But the ear becomes this great point of closing the loop. I like to say it's, it's the window to the soul rather than the eye. Because in the ear we can pick up on uh, Cl uh, closed loop feedback system, let's just, I'll go through this. Just, sorry. <laughs> I do this really well without, <laughs> all right. But just within the ear, we can pick up electroencephalogram, EEG. We can use that to uh, decode spatial attention. Not where my eyes are looking, but where my brain is attending. So whether if, I, if I'm thinking, if I'm talking to you and thinking about whatever's going on over there, within the ear, we could pick that up. We can pick up our galvanic skin response, that same skin conductance that we was anticipatory when we were watching the soccer, when we were watching, sorry, the football penalty kicks. We can pick that up in here. We can pick up um, mental health in the sense that we have microphones. So all of the different vocal dynamics that we're, we were tracking with regard to our mental and physical wellness can also pick to be picked up in here. You can imagine gaze direction, your electrooculogram, when you move your eye, it create, it's a dipole that you can cause a, a signature that we can pick up in ear to know where your eye is directed just by measuring it in your ear. There's this rich, amazing ability to, inter to read and write biological signals. And that's gonna become a critical part of how our technology shapes us. So this is one of the last stories I wanna tell you. Now, how many people are familiar with this species? It's, the marmoset, okay? It's actually native to Brazil. Um, I spent about seven years working with these uh, amazing creatures. 
uh, when I, as a neurophysiologist. And um, they're really unique in so many ways. Uh, marmosets are, you know, because they're native to the Amazon, they're arboreal, they live in trees, dense foliage, but they're also, also amazingly social. And their social dynamics, how they interact with each other, is, is a critical part of their wellness. Now, problem is, if you're in a tree, you can't, do, you, you, can't, they're, they're, you can't really see each other, right? So it's hard to have those emotional exchanges. And what happens in these cases is, you know, old world monkeys that live in Asia, they're very visual. They make a lot of facial expressions. But marmosets have evolved to do different things because when something's compromised, which means they, you know, they can't see each other and they have to communicate, systems evolve to do other things. So in this case, they have rich vocalizations and they also have huge, uh, very effective chemical signaling. The dominant female of a colony secretes pheromones just based on her mental state that completely change the biology of all the other females. You can change the role of one of the females in the colony and her mental state will now change the biology of the other females or her own biology and enable her to start a new colony. But it's all just based on her mind affecting her biology and the biology of everyone else in that social group. And I'm not talking, saying here that you know, we're, we're busy studying human pheromones, but if we don't recognize that the biological signatures and the way we interact socially have a huge impact on each other, we're missing one of the richest parts of our humanity. And some, what, some of the things we look at, because I've told you a lot of the biological signal, signatures, but when we're together in spaces, having rich, heightened emotional experiences, when we're together versus when we're alone, having that same experience, we can see, and we do this, looking at our neural responses, it's not that they're stronger, it's that they're more coherent with each other. You can measure neural coherence and see it. If I'm watching emotional content and I watch it with other people, we can control for all the variables, you'll see a shift so that the signatures become more similar. And that happens when, uh, when we're together in these uh, impactful environments. It's part of why an experience like this has not just, it's not just about the learning, but it is about how you do it in this social context. And those signatures are going to become more and more important, I think, as we evolve and think about our relationship with our technology, because it's not just for us about how we interact. It's why movies and, and uh, uh, concerts have so much impact on us. You know, at Stanford, you've got uh, groups that are, and they're just one group, MIT has another, where they're, you know, patches that are measuring our own biochemistry, in this case, tracking glucocorticoids and our uh, stress levels. So when you start thinking about the dynamics of our spaces, being able to pick up on so much of our biological signals and build this amalgamated representation of our internal experiences, it's going to really be a personal, personalized opportunity to use our own biochemistry and dynamics to alter how we interact in those spaces and how we optimize our performance, our healing, our wellness, our cognitive capacity, not just by reading our signatures, but understanding the true biology of how they're affecting us. Um, so the two last thoughts I'll leave you with, because you have the power, is there's a lot of directions we can go right now. We can build a world that enables us, that empowers us, that leverages the capacity technology can bring, which in the healthcare space and in wellness, there are so many opportunities. There's also a lot of dystopian applications of technology. Technology is never evil. It's always the application. Technology is amazing. Even the most innocuous technology, like a, a selfie filter, can have huge negative impacts on empowerment and wellness to, to a culture. So it's really... It, you want technology to be able to bring the capacity it can to each and every one of us because with healthcare, it's the first time we have this opportunity for democratization of diagnosis through the devices in our homes to people who otherwise might not even know something's wrong with them. It's an opportunity for early intervention when you've got acceleration of the, the gain and benefit of what an early intervention, intervention might really mean because our technology will know much earlier than we will. But then you also have an opportunity for personalized medicine, which used to be something really, and right now is reserved for the elite, to become something for everyone. 
where, tech, where our medicine is optimized to us, our treatment plans, everything is optimized to us at a very low cost. This is hugely impactful. This is a three-legged race, okay? Has anyone done a three-legged race before? Well, I, I wanna make sure, as developers, as creators, as innovators, entrepreneurs, that you remember the three-legged race you're in, which right now, technology, and for the, for the future, it's not just about the computer scientists and the mathematicians. You have to think about the cognitive scientists and the psychologists, and you have to think about the impact it's gonna have on human potential, because it's awesome, but also, and how it's gonna change us. If I could do one thing in how we think about our developments in the world, I would always have a neuroscientist, not who's thinking about how are they gonna use this product, but what's the ramification? How's it gonna change us and shape our brains in different ways? Because every time we enable one thing, it comes at a cost of something else. And sometimes the process, if I build a bread maker, is it the process of baking bread or having the bread that can be more important? In different contexts, it's one or the other, right? And we always have to think about how we're gonna become different humans each time we intersect that. And I think if we have that awareness, we are very powerful to shape the future and leverage technology in the ways we can. So think about what the homunculus is you want to see in three to five years should be, what it is now, and build that future. Thank you, I'll leave you with that. I'm sorry about all the difficulties at the beginning, so thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Two questions. Yes, I can. Hey. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations. Really like everything you said. Oh, you're speaking English? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, congratulations for this pick. Uh, um, my question is, do you have any information about all those expressions change the market and the market intelligence? And how the market this, intelligence? Yeah, and how it will change about the sales and about, how about the market is using this intelligence? Uh, sure. Uh, some of the slides I showed at the beginning were with regard to what we call neural marketing. And that's been around for uh, maybe about 10 years. And it is a multi-billion dollar business. And definitely when you can show, uh, you know, based on uh, signatures, like they, in those cases, they're probably using P300 uh, signatures of our EEG with individuals. And they're able to show that when you have heightened emotional response to a brand or to to an item, you, you know, it does increase sales and it increases brand favorability and it increases the success of the, success of the, the product. You know, so it's sort of a positive across the board when people actually resonate with it in a favorable way emotionally. Many thanks. Hello. Uh, you said you already made some, your class already made some games. Could, uh, could you speak up a little? Uh, um, you said your class already made some games that effectively change the brain of when you play. Can you give uh, an example of how they exactly they change, what they make to change the brain? Sure. What do we do in our classes? Um, um, because really, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I'll just set this down for a moment. <laughs> There's a number of things you can think about. What we do with any uh, thing game that you might be designing is think about what neural circuits are supported. What, what do we want to see changing? My students often build, um, we build brain computer interface games. So in that case, you're getting biological feedback and you're trying to train your biology within the game. You know, it might be a zombie game that they've developed where you're locked in a, a morgue and you're trying to <laughs> solve problems to escape. But at the same time, the real target is reducing mental stress, and it's measuring your biological stress levels while you're performing um, analytic code-breaking tasks, 
and being chased by zombies in a morgue where you're using your spatial awareness to try to get better at that. But that's a, that's a more abstract example. I think some examples that are really obvious um, it, that well maybe not so obvious are say reaction times. I sometimes have athletes and thing you know I use the example of a football player. One of my best VR coders is now a Dallas Cowboy in the U.S. and you know and one of the things that was critical to him was his scene awareness, like being able to have heightened resolution, heightened awareness in an envi spatial environment when he's under cognitive under high stress environments. And so in, for him, what he built was he built a VR, I think it was at this couple of years ago, we used Vives, built a flying environment where he would fly and uh, have a lot of auditory cues while he's flying that were critical to his navigation and finding targets in that environment. And you know, try to capture that key component of scene awareness in a rich multi-sensory environment. Or another example that might be, uh, you know, I think has started things off. It turns out uh, uh, people with uh, uh, dis that are classified as dyslexic or not dyslexic um, actually have different patterns. And this was something that uh, Mike Merzenich did a number of years ago. He's a scientist who's done a lot of seminal work in how we understand brain topography. But he realized that these two different groups of individuals actually had different ways that they integrated sound and something called what we would call a gap threshold. And, and that's simply the timing. If we have an event, boom, boom, the closer together events are in time, sounds, one influences the other and causes us not to hear. Here, it's called masking, forward and bas backward masking. It's a critical um, part of writing any compression algorithm for sound is to know what we hear and what we don't temporally. Turns out if I'm dyslexic, that that timing window is much larger and I'm actually integrating information for a longer period of time. This can lead to let me see the world in a different way that I'd say, you know, is, there's not a right or wrong. It actually lets me see things and understand things differently. But what he realized is he could train kids to actually get better at that auditory temporal detection task and see benefits in, how, in their reading and writing skills. So you're seeing this multi-dimensional kind of difficult to describe performance of something that can be you know, greatly impacted by creating a game where success in that game involves hearing in a different way. And I'm gonna evolve, so I'm gonna design my sounds to do that. My, in my class, we take apart all the games you all play and try to think about them from a development state of what are we doing well? How can we design this differently to be more effective on some domain? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. What's time? Anyhow, thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry about the beginning, but <laughs> glad we got through. You can, you can find me at poppycrumb uh, at, on Twitter at poppycrumb. Look me up anytime. I love to hear from people. So thanks. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry.